Hey everybody, good to see you again. Um, today we're going to go over the first chapter of the book. So we already reviewed the prologue, which was uh, short and quick. This chapter is a little bit longer. I hope I can read it without stuttering too much. In truth, I almost deleted these first few chapters, decided to keep them in and share them with you, as, you know, to reveal a little bit more of the backstory of the players. Um, I toyed with the idea of just starting straight out in Spain, but I decided um, I'll share it with you, see what you think. So in this first chapter, we're meeting with Hunt, who is returning to New York, his home. So, war became wars, months slipped into years, a decade disappeared. Hunt remained, Hunt changed. Hamlin, Romani, all the other hellholes, all the places he destroyed. 13 years spent on war. And after all those years, he found himself home. He found himself alone. New York had transformed since he left. New buildings, new people, new money. But the subway stayed the same. Soot-covered tiles flashed past the window as, as his express train barreled through another station. At least there is no graffiti, he mumbled to himself. They don't know who they're messing with. They don't. No! A homeless man paced, shouting at nothing. He stumbled as the train jostled. People crowded the back half of the car. Strap hangers clutched metal bars and hovered over riders, squeezed into side-by-side -side bucket seats. Those lucky enough to have a bucket seat stared at crotches swaying in rhythm. Several unlucky souls stuck near the doors stood nut to butt. They huffed and strained to see when the next stop would arrive. Someone shouted, move in. No one moved except an old Chinese lady who lifted three green plastic bags, shuffled two paces, and set the bags down in front of two teenage boys playing Angry Birds. Hunt and the homeless man had the front half of the car to themselves. Hunt surfed in place and leaned against the pole resting it in the space between his torso and arm, trying his best not to touch the bar with any exposed skin. He kept his hand tucked in his pocket, where he gripped his knife and pumped the collapsed blade into the fold. The balls of his feet pressed firmly into the floor as the car shifted about. He watched the homeless man from under his hat's lower brim, his hat's lowered brim. Ripped clothes, exposed feet, dirty skin. The homeless man paced back and forth, yelling. Hunt hadn't smelled a human smell that vile before. Not on a living human, anyway. Rotted flesh, shredded flesh, burnt flesh. Had an immediate and recognizable pungency. The smell of this living man filled the train with a sharp, noxious mix of shit, piss, and perspiration so foul... He found himself both fascinated and repulsed. The homeless man ceased pacing, dropped his homeless vet sign, and laid across a row of chairs. The brakes screeched and the one train pulled into 168th Street, Wash Heights. The crowd rushed from the train and stampeded up rusted stairs through the humid subterranean halls to three cattle car elevators where people crammed into the one functional car. The attendant barked, get back, before jiggling a key and closing the elevator. The doors creaked and shuddered as they struggled, as they struggled to shut. The tight, hot car crept one floor. Passengers burst from the elevator and raced street level before the doors finished opening. Gridlock buses, taxis, and gypsy cabs idled along the avenue. Men with Pakistani accents laid on horns. A Jamaican accent shouted, Suck your mother. Yiddish, Spanish, and Russian complained, chatted, and hollered along the bustling sidewalk. Doctors and nurses, dressed in scrubs, rushed in all directions. Garbage blew in the wind, and a yellow, a yellow potato chip bag landed at Hunt's feet. 
His chest tightened. He waved a panhandler away and crossed 168th Street, stopping in front of a Starbucks. He focused on the clear blue sky, focused his entirety on that blue sky. He inhaled and exhaled, opening and closing his hands, stretching his fingers until his muscles relaxed. He unfolded a piece of paper from his pocket and read the scribbled address. Milstein Hospital, 6 Hudson North, 6th Floor. Crumpling the note, he stuffed it back into his pocket and walked past an old armory converted into a track and field center. Race banners flat next to the embrasures. Inside the hospital atrium, a security guard gave him a visitor card and pointed him in the right direction. He made his way to the cancer center and waited at the floors and waited as the floor's receptionist banged on her keyboard, punching her keys. She raised her eyebrows and looked at Hunt like he was wasting her time. Yes. He glared at her, causing her to tense. But then he softened his eyes and his wide shoulders relaxed. He calmly gave his uncle's name. The woman pat, pointed past some breathing equipment. Room 6158. Thank you, ma'am, he replied. He read the room numbers as he passed each door, room after room of people dying from cancer. Outside room 6158, he took off his baseball cap and clenched it tightly in his fist. With his free hand, he ran his fingers over the braille dots on the room sign. Each cream-colored dot, worn away from hundreds of gentle touches, revealed pink plastic underneath. He slapped his cap against his thigh and went inside. The TV blared with the news. Uncle Mike lay glued to his bed dressed in a pitiful gown. Hunt averted his eyes. The man lying there was poked and prodded, attached to several medical machines that beeped and chirped. Nothing about that man resembled the, hunk, the uncle Hunt revered. The uncle who carried every niece and nephew on his back during the, tur during the turkey bowl. The uncle whose laugh shook the room. The uncle who helped guide him after his father had passed. Gone were his bright red cheeks, now gray and sunken. Gone was his heft and muscle, like the very essence of his life had been drained from his body. Decay wafted in the stale air. Hunt shifted his feet and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Uncle Mike rolled his head in his pillow and beamed. Holy shit! Magazines fell from his lap as he tried to sit. He got halfway to his elbows and promptly fell back. His smile never wavered, though. He groped around his bed, searching for something. I didn't think I'd ever see you again, he said as he rifled under his sheets. Ah! He began reeling in a cord, hand over hand, like he had caught a fish. He held up the remote and shut off the t television. Hunt's voice remained direct and measured, but his volume was humbled. Mom said things were bad. He placed his hand on the bedside. Nothing I can't handle, Uncle Mike grinned. The hospital bed whirled, whirred. As a, as, as a mattress crept into the seated position. How are you? He said. I can't even remember the last time I saw you. I'm fine. Same. Good. Good. The bed finished raising and Uncle Mike dropped his hand to his side. It glanced against Hunt's. And Hunt yanked his hand away. Uncle Mike flashed a confused smile, but then moved past the awkward moment. I'm glad you came, he said. Hunt massaged his fist and nodded. He marched over to the window to grab the chair next to the wall. Tulips and carnations lined the radiator that doubled as a windowsill. Clumps of pollen dotted the lily's white petals. White petals. The smell of Easter floated in the air. Hunt sneezed and began opening the drawn shade. Silver beads rattled in the metal clutch. Sunlight flooded the room. Out on the river, a tugboat 
dragged apart. Your mom tells me you're heading to cereal, Uncle Mike said over his shoulder. Hunt nodded without turning around. I'll be honest, I didn't even know we were in Syria or Yemen or wherever the fuck. Were we not? Hunt replied. He secured the window shade and accidentally bumped the radiator as he faced his uncle. A card fell from the lilies. It read, he picked it up and it read, Dear Michael, I owe you more than I could ever give. We're praying for your swift recovery. Love, Lynn. She one of yours? Hunt asked, holding up the card. Uncle Mike coughed and smoothed his gown. Yeah, she's got a bunch of grandkids now, he laughed to himself. Told her she needed to name one of them after me. Hunt tapped the card and returned it to the bouquet. He dragged a guest chair to his uncle's bedside. Uncle Mike removed his breathing tube, settling it on his chest. He'd combed his matted hair with his bony fingers. Didn't want you seeing me like this, he said. You'll beat it, Hunt replied. Uncle Mike tightened his lips and shook his head. Not this time. He reached out and punted, patted Hunt's hand, and Hunt bowed his head, leaving his hand where it lay. I'm glad you came. Of course, Hunt replied. Can't believe they let you take a break from saving the world. I'm not saving anything anymore. You're doing too much. Feels like I'm doing nothing at all. You've been doing it too long. The work doesn't stop. Do me a favor. Uncle Mike picked out a scab on his forearm. Maybe think about hanging it up. Can't, Hunt replied. Uncle Mike huffed. Listen, it's just, it all goes so fast. Look at me here, just like your granddad. Almost to the T, he got his cancer 15 years after the Verizon fire. And me, just the same. Stuck here, just the same. Shit luck, Hunt replied. You don't get it. They ignored it then, just like they're trying to ignore it now. But we got smarter, more organized. He waved his finger in the air, but then the fire left his voice. Whatever, doesn't matter. In the end, it's just a bunch of guys dying from cancer. They got their red dot. We got ours. Gray scrambled eggs remained untouched on Uncle Mike's food tray. The overbed table was rolled off to the side. Hunt lifted the tray and dumped the food into the trash. Want to break out of here? He smiled. Go hit AC one last time. Steaks and cards. Get some real food. Uncle Mike barked a sharp, a sharp wet cough. Goddamn right. All I want is one last cigarette. And everyone keeps giving me shit about it. Can't smoke. These idiots. I tried telling them, worse ain't gonna happen. Cigarette and a beer. One last trip to see the boys at Farrell's. That's what I want. They still got styrofoam cups. Only thing that don't change. He laughed. You wouldn't even recognize the old neighborhood no more. Been invaded by a bunch of granola eating marshmallows. It's not home anymore, Hunt replied. It is. It's not. Hunt shook his head. I walked around the block the other day and people kept looking at me like I didn't belong. Like I should leave. Like I was dangerous. I grew up on that block. I lived there for 20 years. Went to war. Defended our home. And now, it's all gone. Hunt pressed into his chair. Mom hit the lotto. She should sell the house and leave. She'll never leave, Uncle Mike replied. She should. That's the house she bought with your dad. The house you were born in. The house where you were raised. The house where you, you lived when he died. It's a structure. One day you'll understand. Will I? Hunt said. You know what? Our house was the only one with the flag. Used to be everyone had a flag. How am I supposed to understand that? Times change, Uncle Mike said. French curator, Wisconsin lawyers, British banker. Could you imagine if Mr. O'Malley was still around? A Brit living on the block? Oh, forget O'Malley. 
Kyle was a miser, Uncle Mike said. And the Brits got better whiskey. You met him? Like I said, he's got good whiskey. When did everything get flipped on its head? Slowly, Uncle Mike said. Then all at once, a cancer hunt scoff. Uncle Mike adjusted the needle attached to his arm. Do you have to go? What's that, Hunt replied? Syria, or wherever. I have to replace someone, Hunt said. Uncle Mike squeezed Hunt's hand. One day it might be you needing replacing. That's for the fates to decide. Sure, the fates. Tears welled up in Uncle Mike's eyes. He wiped them and patted Hunt's hand. Look, you're not hearing me. I love you. I do. I love you like you as my own son. I just don't want you ending up here. Not early, not like us. Uncle Mike motioned to the hospital room. Like me, your dad, your pop. Hunt slid his, head from, his hand from the bed and rested at the top of his lap. It's who we are. Maybe, maybe not, Uncle Mike replied. Maybe it's time to stop. An alarm rang. Nurses and dark doctors rushed down the hall. Uncle Mike began nervously tapping his bed. Then his hand began to shake. Hunt leaned forward and held it tight. I don't want to die, not like this. Too young, too young, Uncle Mike whispered. You'll get through it, Hunt replied. Uncle Mike fumbled with his breathing tube. And Hunt helped him slip it over his ears. Uncle, Uncle Mike inserted the nub into his nose. Sure, he said. He pressed the remote, and his bed began to recline. He rolled his head and looked at the flowers, covered it by covering the radiator. Could you close this shade before you go? Hunt lowered the shade and placed his cap on top of his head. I'll be back before I go. I'll be back before I go to Syria. Check in on you. Or I'll be back before I go. Check in to see how you're doing. Uncle Mike ignored him. His skin became grayer, his eyes sadder. Hunt laid the blanket across his uncle's chest and made his way to the door before turning around. I'll see you soon, Uncle Mike, he said. In the darkness of the room, the TV flipped on and the announcers blathered. Uncle Mike closed his eyes and passed. All right, that's chapter one. Sorry, I stumbled a bit there. It's uh, harder with the longer chapters. Um, uh, sometimes it's easy to skip a word. And, you know, part of me wants to make this a performance, but part of it, I'm not a very good actor, but part of me also just wants to, like, be transparent, show what it is, um, show what the process is, good and bad. So anyway, hopefully you appreciate it, and I promise to do better next time. Thank you very much, and uh, talk soon. All right, bye.